evening, uh, we're in Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And you know what? I forgot uh, what text I was going to read. I do have my text in front of me. What, what do you have? <laughs> Projector is currently broken. Red light's on. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, in that case, um, let's see. I guess I can read whatever I want. Um, <laughs> so why don't we begin in verse 20. And then we'll read through verse 28. I think that'll encompass pretty much what I want to look at to see. So 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 28. Now again, Paul is, is, he begins this section by talking about the gospel, and that of course includes not only the fact that Jesus came, he died, but he was also raised again from the dead. He goes on to talk about the importance of the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, then Jesus hasn't been raised, and if he hasn't been raised, then we are basically without hope. We're lost, and those who died have perished. But he goes on to talk about the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, and because he has, we will live not only spiritually, but also physically. Uh, he goes on to talk about the resurrection from the dead, which is very key to what we're going to be looking at this evening. But let's pick up the narrative in verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all in all. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, you'll recall that last week uh, we were looking at the millennium, and that is specifically that thousand-year period that is referred to in Revelation chapter 20. Again, that's the only place in Scripture that the millennium is referred to. Now, you, we saw that um, all in the church agree that there is a millennium. You can hardly deny its existence when it's clearly in Scripture. But we also saw that there are some areas in which the churches, or those in churches, of course, the church as a whole, disagree. We don't agree on the character of the millennium. We don't agree on its duration. And we also do not agree when it actually takes place or when it begins. We saw that some believe that the millennium, as far as its character, is going to be a time of warfare from the very beginning to the very end. It's going to be a warfare between the two kingdoms, struggling neck and neck, sometimes one gaining the ascendancy, sometimes the other. Whereas others believe that during the time of the millennium, God's kingdom is going to break forth into this world with such power that we're going to see its blessings, and it's going to bring peace and prosperity. Some see the millennium as a literal thousand-year period. Others see it as a period that lasts much longer, that the thousand years is basically a figurative number that refers to a long period of time. Some see it as beginning when Jesus Christ comes again in his second coming, while others see it happening before 
Jesus Christ comes again. And we saw last week that our position on the millennium is basically this, that Jesus is going to come at the end of the millennium. Remember, we saw that it's the time between his first and his second coming, between the time that he comes into the world to bind the strong man, to bind Satan, so that he may no longer deceive the nations, that the kingdom of heaven may grow throughout the earth. Basically, before Jesus Christ came into the world, the kingdom of heaven was located in just one place, and that is Israel. The rest of the earth was in darkness under uh, basically into the, the darkness that Satan brought. But now with the strong man being bound, his house may be plundered, and that's exactly what's taking place right now. The world is being evangelized. But the thousand years will end with the loosing of Satan, who goes out to gather the nations together against the church just prior to the second coming. So again, the millennium is... It, when Jesus Christ comes again, it is to, to destroy Satan and uh, his followers as they bring persecution against the church. He comes at the end of the millennium or the end of that thousand years. We also don't believe the thousand years is a literal number. For one thing, it appears in a book that is highly visionary and symbolic. That is the book of Revelation. And secondly, the time between Christ's first and second coming is already stretched to almost 2,000 years. So therefore, it is you know, symbolic. It, it basically refers to a number of perfection. Now, the one area that we have yet to look at that we differ on in this denomination in general and in this fellowship in particular is the character of the millennium. Now, there are things that we do agree on with regard to what's going on in the millennium. We do agree that this is the time of Christ's reign. But we disagree on the effect that his reign is going to have in this world, whether it's going to be warfare to the end or whether there is going to come a time when the world is basically going to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and experience his temporal blessings on earth. So what I'd like to do is work from the area in which we first agree on, that Jesus Christ is reigning when, it, when his reign begins and when it ends, to the area in which we disagree, and that is the character of the millennium. To see that really either way we have a great deal to be encouraged by as far as what's going to happen in the future. So let's consider two things that we agree on first. And that is that Jesus is reigning now. Secondly, that his reign will come to an end at the second coming after all his enemies are subdued under his feet. Now, next week, what I want us to do is consider the final point, and that is whether that subjection of his enemies under his feet is going to make a substantial difference in this world, whether it's going to make a visible difference perhaps a remarkable difference before Jesus comes again. So again, we're going to consider those first two points this evening. First of all, let's consider that Jesus is reigning now. Paul writes this in, in uh, verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 15, and this is really where a great deal of this is going to come from. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. By the way, that one verse without any explanation should give to us a great deal of optimism about the future because Jesus is reigning and he will continue to reign until all of his enemies are subdued. That's wonderful news. Now I want to emphasize the fact that Jesus is reigning now because of the differences of opinion that exist regarding that in the church today. Many churches believe that Jesus Christ may be reigning, but he's not reigning with the kind of power that he will reign with until he comes again at the second coming and brings in the millennium. Basically, what I want us to see is the millennium is now. And so he is reigning with absolute power and authority now. Now, the Bible teaches that he is reigning now with absolute authority, and I want to use this word absolute again because of the idea or the fact that there are those in the church who believe that he's reigning 
but not with the kind of power that he will reign with later, that he has sort of limited authority. His rule right now is absolute, and it will remain so until he returns. By the way, again, I mentioned before, the others believe it doesn't begin until he finally comes to usher in the millennium, but as a matter of fact, he's reigning right now during the millennium, and his reign is going to end when he comes again. But we'll look at that a little bit further now. First of all, it's clear that his reign began at his ascension. You know, there are so many places in Scripture that mention this, it's hard to believe that it's not seen by some segments of the church. The author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 13, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. And what the author to the Hebrews is telling us is that after Jesus Christ died on the cross and was raised again to life, and of course, if we, as we look at the rest of the New Testament, appeared to over 500 witnesses over a period of 40 days. He ascended into heaven and sat down at the place of greatest honor. The ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ was the day of his coronation, the day he took up his authority and began to rule. This was the day that was predicted in the Old Testament in many different places, but particularly in Psalm 2, where the psalmist writes that after the kings and rulers of the earth stood together against the Lord, trying to keep the Father from installing his son on Mount Zion as king, that he was enthroned with absolute authority over the world. We read in Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9, where the Father says to the Son, Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Again, Paul tells us that this was fulfilled at the resurrection, or actually following the resurrection, where he writes in Ephesians 1, verses 20 through 22. God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. Now again, the point is simply this, that the, the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ where he has absolute power and authority is not future from our perspective, but it's taking place right now. By the way, that means that we are right now in the millennium because the millennium is the time of Christ's reign according to John as we saw last week in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, feel free to turn this up in your Bibles if you want to follow along but Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6. Again Revelation 20 is the only chapter in the Bible where the millennium occurs and it tells us what begins the millennium, and that is, of course, the binding of Satan. It tells us about the end of the millennium, where Satan is released just prior to that. But it also tells us what's going on in between the binding and the loosing of Satan in verses 4 through 6. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. 
Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now, what do we see going on in here? Except that Jesus Christ is reigning and those who are his are reigning with him. By the way, as I read this, I realize there's a great deal about using this text and this subject that requires explaining in order to get the full point of this. But let me try to draw a few points out anyway. First of all, what is the first resurrection that he's referring to? Because it's those who are part of the first resurrection that actually get to enjoy this ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, according to John 5, verse 25, this first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection that takes place when one trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, or at least in conjunction with that. Jesus says in John 5, verses 25 and 26, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. Now Jesus here is not talking about bodily resurrection. He goes on to talk about the fact, he says, don't marvel at this, but an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs are going to hear his voice and come forth. We saw that, I believe, last time in the fact that there is one resurrection that takes place when Jesus Christ comes again. What he's talking about here is a spiritual resurrection, one that was taking place as Jesus was speaking, as he was teaching, as he was preaching the gospel. An hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Well, who are these dead? They're the ones who are spiritually dead, as we all are when we come into the world. And yet there are some who hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear live. That has to do, of course, with God's sovereign power to quicken the dead. But it's those who are part of this first resurrection who actually trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who are born again of the Spirit, that participate with Christ during this time of his ruling and reigning. Now, Jesus is saying that those who trusted him will reign with him when they die. Uh, he goes on to talk about those that... Um, experienced various things, and here he's referring to what takes place in the book of Revelation. Uh, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image had not received the mark and so forth. Now I realize that there's a number of people who believe that that's something that's future. But I do believe it's referring to something that's past. It has to do with what was taking place in 70 AD, persecution of Rome against the Christians, what the Caesars were requiring of the people of, of the Jews and of, of basically the Christians that they offer the pinch of incense to Caesar, and they say that Caesar is Lord, that those who are not willing to succumb to that because they are a part of the first resurrection and trusted in Jesus Christ, they would not worship anyone but Jesus Christ. And so they would not worship this, this one that is referred to here. They've already died. They've already been martyred. But now during this millennium, they come to life and they reign with Christ. They're reigning with him now in heaven. Everyone who is a part of the first resurrection who have trusted in Jesus Christ are going to rule and reign with him during this time. Not just those who may have suffered that persecution uh, that, uh, again, Jesus was warning his disciples about in Mark 13, as we saw this morning, and which I believe the book of Revelation is about. But those who trust in Jesus at any time after that, during the millennium, the time between the first coming of Christ and the second, when Satan is bound and when Satan is released. Basically, what this means is that if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you die, you will also reign with him. If that isn't the case, then it doesn't make any sense what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Notice that if 
we endure, we will also reign with him. Now, if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and we've been raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, if we are one of his and we endure to the end of our lives trusting in Jesus, then when we die, we will go to be with him where he is ruling and reigning, not in the future, but right now. Remember his coronation day was the day of his ascension. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is far above all rule and authority and power. Everything is placed in subjection under his feet. Right now, those who suffered with him are ruling and reigning with him, and you will too if you are trusting him and you endure to the end of your lives. By the way, this alone shows us that we have an, well, an optimistic future, I would say. I mean, what kind of a of a privilege is it to be placed in authority in Christ's kingdom and to rule and reign with him as he is ruling over the entire earth. That can also be a bit intimidating too, can it? Because how much experience do you have in ruling and reigning over anything? We do need to remember that we may not know much about it now, but when the Lord takes us to be with him, he will give us the grace that is necessary to do this. But again, my point was this, the fact that he is reigning now means that his absolute rule doesn't begin when he returns. It's something that is taking place right now as we speak. So he is ruling and reigning now. And this brings us to the second point, which is when is this reign actually going to end? Well, it's going to end at his second coming. Again, it's interesting the differences of opinion within the church. The premillennialists believe that his, um, his reign begins when he comes again. He's going to come before the millennium. He's going to reign for a thousand years. What I'm saying is that this text tells us that he is actually going to end his reign when he comes the second time. It's not going to be the beginning, but the end. Again, look at our text in verse 25. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Notice the word until gives us the terminus, as it were, the end. He's going to reign until this takes place. What's going to take place? It's going to end his reign, the subjection of all of his enemies. Now, Paul tells us plainly which the last enemy is. You know, all the enemies are going to be subjected under his feet. His reign is going to end once they're all subjected, which means when the last enemy is subjected to him, that's when his reign is going to end. Well, what is the last enemy? Look at verse 26. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. And that is the enemy that Jesus Christ is going to overcome when he comes again. Because what happens when Jesus Christ comes again? What happens at the second coming? The resurrection. He's going to raise all the dead, translate all the living, gather them all together for the final judgment. It's at that point, <clears throat> Paul tells us, that death will be vanquished. If you look at verse 54 in 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the resurrection when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I hope you, understand, you can see right there. I think really what's more in view here, he is talking about the resurrection, but he's also talking about the translation of living believers, but when the resurrection takes place and the conversion of those who are alive into that glorious state, death will be swallowed up once and for all. Death will be vanquished. The last enemy will be put in subjection under his feet. That happens when Christ comes again. Now that's spelled out more clearly for us in verses 22 through 24. Speaking of the resurrection, Paul says this, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. 
Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. I hope you see there that all these things are all tied in together as far as the end of his reign. But notice, first of all, Paul says Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. Does that mean he was the first person who was ever raised from the dead? Uh, not necessarily, because there were those who were raised in the Old Testament. Uh, there were those who were raised before Jesus was raised. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, the earth shook, the tombs opened, and many of the saints actually were raised again to life and went into the city. But I do think they died again. So it could be that Jesus Christ was the first one who was raised, who stayed raised, or it could be referring to the fact that he is the source or the fountainhead of the resurrection. He is the first fruits. But notice, after that, those who are Christ at his coming, when he returns, he is going to raise those who are his. This is the second coming. This is the resurrection. But what else happens when that takes place? Then comes the end. The end of what? Well, the end of human history, certainly, because he's coming to raise the dead and, you know, he's coming to translate the living. There's not going to be any human history going on after that. But it is also the end of his reign. It ends when he comes again. This is when he hands the kingdom over to the Father after he has abolished all rule, authority, and power. Notice his reign doesn't begin at his second coming. His reign ends at his second coming. I hope you can see that. Now, there is a sense in which he will continue to rule as the God-man under his father's authority. But during the millennium, during the time of his reign, he has absolute authority. It's all been handed over to him. Jesus said before he gave his great commission, all power and authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples. During this thousand years, he has absolute authority in his reign as the mediators. We call it the mediatorial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one in sovereign control right now. But when his work is complete and all of his enemies are subdued and the last enemy is subdued, then he's going to hand the kingdom over to his father and then he will continue to rule, but as it were, under his father. His absolute rule will be ended at that point. Now again, this is just the reverse of what many evangelicals believe today. They believe it begins when he comes again, but it actually ends at that time. By the way, the end of his reign, I mean, we, we not only have the time of his reign to, to be optimistic about, we're going to see more about that next week. But the fact that when we die, we get to reign with him, that, that's something that you know, is, is certainly something to look forward to. But we also have to look forward to the end of his reign because when it's over, something wonderful is going to take place. The last thing that Jesus Christ is going to do is to reverse the effects that sin has on our bodies when he returns again. Verses 21 and 22 in 1 Corinthians 15, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And I believe what Paul means by that is not everyone in the world, but everyone who is in Christ is going to be made alive. Now, Scripture tells us that Adam's sin in the garden against the Lord resulted in death, the death of all of his children with only one exception, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ because he's not reckoned in Adam's line because he was supernaturally conceived in the womb of the virgin. But it brought about the death of his children. What we would say is a very unnatural tearing apart of the body and soul so as to leave us for a time as a soul without a body. Not to mention the fact that it also leaves us with the struggle that we have now against sin. The reason why we have to struggle with it right now 
is because of what Adam did and the condemnation that comes from sin. If it weren't for the Lord Jesus Christ, we would all suffer in hell forever. But our Lord's obedience in becoming one with us and God becoming man in obeying for us, in dying for us, and being raised again to life for us has resulted not only in the redemption of our souls, but also in the redemption of our bodies. Now, we are going to grow old, and we are going to die. I mean, just look around. <laughs> you know, we are getting older, all of us. Some of us are still on the upswing, but uh, many of us are on the downswing. And that's because of Adam's sin. We are going to die. But the Bible tells us we are going to be raised again to life because of what Jesus Christ has done on the day that he returns to vanquish death. And that's going to be at the very end of his reign. That's why Paul writes in verse 55 of 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Christ has vanquished death. He has taken the sting out of death. He has removed the power of death over us. He is going to raise us again to life. And that's certainly something to look forward to because when he raises us again, as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, he's not going to raise us with the same body as it were, the same at least condition that we went into the grave. We're going to have the same body, but it's going to be changed, transformed, and glorified and made into the image of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is something, as I've said, to look forward to at the end of Christ's reign. But don't forget that while we're waiting for his return, we're going to be occupied in heaven, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ for whatever is left of the millennium. I would say just from these points alone, and by the way, I mean, we, there's even more to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. But for the Christian, our future is full of hope because of what Jesus Christ has done. Now, the only thing we have to do to be a part of this is to make sure that we're trusting in Jesus Christ, that we're turning from our sins and we are following him and not following the world. Jesus tells us that if we'll trust in him, he will give us the grace we need to make sure that we endure to the end. We, we have to remember that that is what Paul said to Timothy we must do. If we deny him, he's going to deny us. But if we die with him, we will live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. Our future would have been grim if it hadn't been for Jesus Christ, but he has made it glorious. And he offers that glory and that, that hopeful future to us through the gospel if we'll only trust him, and turn from our sins, and follow him. If you do, you will be a part of that future. And again, there's much more to the future than just that, but that uh, enough, I mean, that alone is enough to give us optimism for the future. Now, next time we're going to consider whether this subjection of Christ's enemies under his feet during the time of the millennium is going to have any effect on the present time or whether it isn't. You know, is it going to break into, as it were, history? Is it going to make a visible difference? If so, then here's another level of optimism for the future and something that we can look forward to as believers, again, realizing that even if we don't live to see that, we can know that what we're doing now in praying for that and in laboring to bring it about is going to be used by the Lord actually to bring it about because the Lord doesn't do anything except he works through his people to bring it about. And you know, the thing is, I, I mentioned earlier today to someone that um, uh, you know, Edwards and those who lived during his time believed that the Lord might be bringing this glorious age and the subjection of Christ's enemies under his feet during their time when they saw the Great Awakening. And so they began a concert of prayer. Everybody he knew, everyone that, you know, all the ministers that he knew in Scotland and in New England and so forth, they, they uh, uh, had their congregation set aside particular time for prayer. And they prayed and they sought that God might bring that revival. 
Now, they didn't see the answer to that prayer. They, they died, and the Lord didn't bring another revival during their time. But in the next century, there was a tremendous movement in the church called the missionary movement where many people who had not heard the gospel before began to hear the gospel. And many believed that that was God's answer to their prayers. And the point is simply this, that if you know something like this is ahead, even if you don't live to see it, but you pray for it, your prayers are still going to be used by God to bring it about. And that's another way we can... Uh, contribute to the kingdom of heaven, another way we can invest in it. But we need to know what's ahead so that we can do that. That's what we're going to be looking at next time. Again, I think giving to us another level of optimism for the future. But for now, let's rejoice in the fact that God has promised to us that trusting in Jesus Christ, when we die, we will reign with him. And that when the end of his reign comes, he will return and he will reverse the effects of sin on our bodies and he will glorify them. And we will be reunited with our souls and we will ever be with the Lord. That's certainly something to look forward to. Well, let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us apply this to our lives to make a difference. Let's, let's pray.